We are excited to have you join us for today's webinar with, a, with our guest, Tara Sheehan, the Executive Director of the Association of Public Policy Analysis and Management, or APAM for short. But before I bring up our guests, let me first go over the format for today's webinar. For the first part of the event, Ms. Sheehan will be giving a presentation on the role of public policy in challenging times. Afterwards, I'll bring in some fellow classmates for a roundtable discussion with our guest speaker. Afterwards, we will allow our audience members to pose any questions they may have. Audience members, if you have any questions you would like to pose during the audience Q&A session, please do not send them via the chat, but rather via the Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Audience members can submit their questions anytime throughout the event via the Q&A feature. Keep in mind that you do not have to wait until the audience Q&A to submit your questions. I will pose audience questions to Ms. Sheehan once we have reached that part of the event. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Tara Sheehan has served as the Executive Director of the Association since 2010. In this role, she is the Chief Operating Officer and oversees all programs, services, and the st strategic direction for APAM. Her responsibilities include oversight of all meetings and conferences, including the annual fall research conference, attended by more than 2,500 academics, practitioners, researchers, and students who present original research at 300 plus sessions each November. She also manages APAM's finances, website, publications, awards, member services, and all governance functions for the 2000 member organization. During her tenure, APAM went under its first ever strategic planning process, redesigned the website, established a social media presence, redesigned the logo, reduced the size of the governing board, increased the budget of the organization by 40%, increases membership, took over management, management of two other social science organizations, ASHCON and NTA, and made the organization more responsive to member needs. Previously, Ms. Sheen was the Director of Membership and Marketing at the Radio Television Digital News Association, or RTDNA. Her responsibilities included management of the annual conference, creation of content for the website, and management of a monthly magazine. Prior to RTDNA, Machine was the membership and marketing director for the United Motor Coach Association, a trade association in Alexandria, Virginia. She has served in the number two position at, bo at both RTDNA and UMA, and has a long history of association and nonprofit management experience in the Washington, DC area. We are very proud of her accomplishments and we're excited to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker. Ms. Sheehan, the floor is now yours. Oh, thanks, that was a very kind, kind introduction. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen because I have a few slides. Um, so, so I'm just gonna go over what APAM is and I'm sure there are a lot of you that haven't heard of it and are unsure of what exactly we do. So I'm gonna go over that briefly. Um, and then I hope we can uh, answer some questions and chat a bit. So, okay. Let me, there we go. So what is APAM? APAM is a nonprofit association founded in 1978 and we're dedicated to improving public policy and management by fostering excellence in research, analysis, and education. So what is a nonprofit association? It's funny, I always am, uh, am shocked at, all, at, at, at how many folks kind of don't know what an association is. And if you're not really involved in the world of associations, you really are not sure what an association is. So an association is a, a nonprofit membership organization. Uh, probably some of the most famous ones are um, AARP, uh, AAA, um, the NRA is one. Um, but largely what these organizations all have in common is they are, they are comprised of members. Uh, they have usually a publication, like uh, APAM has a publication, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. They usually have an annual conference. Uh, they do generally some sort of lobbying or advocacy work, which APAM does a little bit of advocacy work, not a ton of it. Um, trade associations generally do a little bit more in the, in the realm of, of lobbying. Um, but these groups kind of are, are, are usually located in, in Washington, D.C. There's quite a number of them in Chicago as well um, because they do a lot of um, advocacy and lobbying work. So APM was founded by a group of graduate programs in public policy and management. Um, again, that was in 1978. They created a conference and it later became our fall conference, which is still our marquee event. And the association itself came after that. Um, so back in 1978, public policy, uh, 
programs, graduate programs, and even undergrad, certainly undergraduate programs too, were really fledgling. There weren't that many of them. And at the time in 1978, there were 13 of these programs across the United States. They kind of banded together to create this conference and later the association um, just to discuss issues of curricula, of kind of where the field was going, um, social science research in general, et cetera. So APAM was housed at Duke University from 1978 to 1993. So for the real, a long period of time, it was a part of Duke University. HQ moved to DC in uh, 1993 and a full-time executive director was hired. Now in 2021, we have about 4,000 professional members, seven full-time staff and a budget of 2 million. So we definitely have grown, grown quite a bit in, in that time. Um, as I said, our marquee event is the annual fall research conference. It's held every November, it moves around the country and every other year we're in Washington, DC. Um, about a thousand research papers are presented each fall um, and about 2,500 researchers, academics, practitioners, professors, and students come from around the world to present their research in a variety of policy areas. So one of the things um, about APAM is we're a very general organization. There's lots of people that are members and they study a lot of different things. We have a lot of members that study education policy, transportation policy, health policy, um, terrorism policy, et cetera, national defense, transportation policy, you kind of name it and we have members that study it. Uh, we have two student conferences, an international conference, uh, several professional development events for students and new professionals in the field of social science research, uh, several annual webinars and podcasts, uh, a highly ranked peer reviewed journal, which I mentioned earlier, JPAM. And we present several field awards and have a pretty vibrant social media presence. Um, okay, so why should students be interested in, uh, in APAM? Um, one of the things that, I, that I'm pretty proud of in the time that I've been here is we've grown student membership by quite a bit. We, we have almost 1500 student members. Most of them are PhD. Uh, program students, but we do have a, a number of master students too. And we've started um, some activities to reach out to undergraduate uh, student members as well um, in order to, to A, introduce the field of public policy to them while while you guys are, are in a public policy program. There are lots of students around the uh, around the country in, in uh, universities that are not familiar with public policy as a program. Um, so we have a number of things that we do for students. Uh, we have a student activities committee and we have students on our policy council. So our policy council is our governing board. And we appoint one student every year to represent all the student members on our uh, governing board. So there's always two, uh, two student members and they rotate off um, in staggered terms. So we're always appointing one each year. Um, and then we also have a student activities committee, which is generally about seven uh, students, and they are nominated for service by their professors to serve on the uh, on the student activities committee. And, and this committee basically helps staff to more closely align programming to fit the needs of students, because we want to make sure we're, we're running programming that is interesting and important and most of all useful uh, to students in your studies. So we have, as I said, we had we have student conferences and seminars. Um, we've had we have had two student student conferences since 2016. So we started our first one in Washington D.C. and then the second one followed shortly thereafter in California in 2017. And the first one was at UC Riverside. And as I was saying to uh, the panel before we before we got started, I had never been to Riverside before, and the campus is beautiful, and Riverside is is a, a lovely town. So. So it was really nice to, to be there. Uh, student conferences give students a chance to present research to professionals and get some feedback in a supportive environment. So if you're a PhD student and you're doing a bunch of original research, but you haven't really spoken about it yet, this is a good opportunity to get up and, and, and get some good feedback from professionals as you're explaining your, your research. Excuse me. Um, we have a number of virtual professional development events. So uh, last year we did nine sessions over eight weeks covering topics such as careers and cocktails, what you need to launch your career, next stop PhD, and looking for a job in a down market. These were really 
very popular events, which we kind of were not expecting them to be because they were kind of run over the summer when everybody was starting to get zoomed out at that point. Um, but I guess if you have a cocktail, you can talk about anything. So we had lots of students um, come and listen to professionals on a panel and network. And while nobody really likes networking over Zoom, it definitely was a, a, a nice uh, a nice substitute uh, for the moment. We have um, equity and inclusion fellowships for students and new professionals. So these are our fellowship program is designed to help underrepresented students and new professionals participate in our fall research conference and in APAM activities. So this is a program we started also in 2016. We award 40 fellowships every year to underrepresented students in order for them to attend our fall research conference, wherever it might be, and network with each other and our board and all the attendees at the conference. And this year we are um, creating a new fellowship for new professionals to the field. So if you're a new professional who has either a master's or a PhD and you've only been in the field for five years or under, um, there'll be a new uh, fellowship for you. And, and, and uh, so we hope you kind of stay tuned for that. There'll be more information on our website about that soon. And we just started a Let's Grab a Coffee podcast, which is a student run podcast. It's our student activities committee runs this, po this podcast and they cover topical uh, topical things like COVID, public housing research, why you might wanna get a PhD in public policy, et cetera. So it's, they're like 15, 20 minute, easy, easily digestible podcasts. You can listen to them real quick and kind of get a sense of um, what's going on. So there's lots of things for students. Most of it is for, uh, as I said, PhD students, but we're, we're reaching out to undergraduates and, and master's students as well. Um, so why is APAM important to the fields? I mean, I think it's very important, but we maybe don't do as good a job as we should of uh, kind of telling folks why um, the things that we do are important to the social science research field. So one of the things we try to do more than anything is connect researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. So we have a lot of members that are at universities like UC Riverside and universities across the country that do a ton of research, a ton, a veritable ton. And what we want for that research to do is inform policymaking and also get into the hands of people that implement the policies. So kind of making that triangle kind of uh, whole, if you will, um, is one of the things that we try to do all the time. And uh, how successful we are, I, I'm, I'm not I, I, I'm not quite sure yet because it's an ongoing slog, if you will, but um, it's important, I think, for research and data and evidence to inform the, the public debate about uh, any kind of policy. So kind of dovetailing with that, we promote the importance of evidence and policymaking and the importance of social science research to the federal government. Uh, we also do it for state government too, but one of the things uh, that we support through our membership and through the work that our members do is promoting uh, the importance of data, data collection, facts, evidence, et cetera, um, as the basis uh, for the research that we do. Um, and and hopefully it will inform uh, policy making. Um, we connect schools of public policy, public administration and public affairs to help promote best practices on curriculum building. So uh, schools like UC Riverside and others, we have about 100 um, institutional members that are largely uh, public policy and public affair programs. Um, so we connect those programs together to kind of have uh, discussion about best practices, about curriculum building, about uh, admission standards, about admissions practices, how best to kind of learn from one another. Um, and as I said, you know, on my first slide, there the basis of APAM is public policy and administration programs. So we have sort of deep roots in that area. Um, one of the things we're trying to do more aggressively is introduce undergraduates to the world of public policy and what jobs in the field might look like. And I know it's, uh, we were talking earlier before, uh, before we got started about what, uh, what some folks on the panel might be doing after, after graduating. And 
that's a, it's just a loaded question and a, and a, and a tough uh, a tough issue to to grapple with when you're kind of a, a senior. But uh, one of the things that we have found is that folks maybe aren't sure what a job looks like in public policy is. A, it, are, are, do you, are there only researchers? Do you only work for the federal government? Do you only work for universities? And the answer is that it's all of those things. So you can have a public policy degree, whether it's a master's degree or a PhD, um, and do research at the university level, but you can also you know, work for Google or VRBO or any of these private sector folks that are consistently hiring now researchers and analysts to, to, to kind of work in their, in their groups, but also the federal government, the state government, the local government, there are a number of options with a public policy degree or a public administration degree. It's not sort of as narrow as it used to be, I think. Um, and we also have a, a, a pretty deep commitment to increasing diversity and equity in the field, not only with our fellowships, but with uh, making sure that uh, the people on our board and our staff kind of reflect the world that we live in. Uh, and that's about it that I have for APAM for the moment. I, I know you sent me some questions ahead of time, which I put on this slide. They're kind of small, so I'm not sure that you, if you can see them, I can also just get rid of it if it's easier for you guys to ask me, ask me them uh, orally. Yeah, um, that would be great. We could ask the questions. It is okay. really small, yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Right. Thank you so much for this presentation, Ms. Sheehan. And at this time, I'd like to now bring in my fellow public policy classmates for the roundtable discussion. Um, joining me are Maddie Bunteen, Daisy Gonzalez, and Kevin Karami. Thank you all for participating. Our first question comes from Kevin. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, we're so delighted to have you here, Ms. Sheehan. Um, I understand that you received a master's of public policy degree with a concentration in transportation policy from uh, George Mason University. Um, I was just wondering what led you to public policy and specifically transportation policy? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I, I, I would say it a little bit before we, before we got started. Um, so I graduated, I went to NYU undergraduate and I was a psychology major and I was, I was pretty sure that um, I wanted to be a social worker. And after, after college, I got a job, um, direct service social work. So I worked at a methadone clinic. I worked at a, a woman's shelter. And I did that for about three years and it was incredibly interesting work, but also incredibly hard, just easily the hardest jobs I've ever had and heartbreaking in, in many respects. Um, and during it, I, I kind of realized that direct service was was maybe not for me, not for not for the long run. Um, but I was very interested in the policies and the and and the, and the regulations that kind of went into that kind of work, and thought that public policy might be a better direction for me. So uh, I moved to DC and I applied for graduate programs, and I wound up going to George Mason, and it was a pretty fledgling program at that point. Um, and it was right after 9-11 where social science research and research in general and kind of policy analysis really kind of exploded and was on TV all the time and, and, and kind of national security and government work and all of that. Well, of course it was always important. It was kind of on TV constantly. Um, so I was, it, it definitely helped influence uh, my decision in terms, of, in terms of what to study. And I am embarrassed to admit that the reason that I picked transportation policy was because I worked at the United Motor Coach Association at the time. And in order to waive out of my internship requirement, I picked transportation policy because I was involved with it at the time. Um, so I wound up picking that and I was able to wave out of uh, my internship requirement. However, transportation policy was pretty interesting and I kind of thought it would be very boring and it wasn't. Um, we did a couple case studies on hot lanes, high occupancy lanes um, during my time there because they were like a brand new, they're still around now, but they're brand, they were brand new in, in uh, the Washington DC area. So it was very interesting. I, I kind of, I, I, I should not have, have thought ill of transportation policy because it it's very cool. Although to this day, I've not really done anything with that particular concentration, but it was very interesting. 
Thank you. Um, now um, our next question comes from Maddie. Thank you. And yes, I always think it's interesting how people, you know, end up concentrating or in something or, or choosing their path. I think it's different for everyone. Um, and I just want to welcome, um, echo everyone on welcoming you to UCR. Oh, right. Yeah, we're just so thankful to have this talk with you today. I was wondering if you could share with us any insights about your career and what brought you to APAM, maybe grad school um, forward? Sure. Um, so I was, so when I moved here, I moved here, as I said, to, to go to, to apply to graduate school. And I, I was kind of working in restaurants. I was young, like I was bartending, kind of bouncing around and going to school. And um, I got a temp job at an association, the American Society for Microbiology. Um, and I stopped bartending and stopped waiting tables and just went to school and, and, and worked at, at, at ASM. And I had never really heard of an association. I never really was interested in kind of nonprofit work. Um, and I really liked it and it was really interesting. And I left there and then I went to, to UMA, which was a, a trade association and it's kind of, it's funny because people in the, in the association world and the nonprofit world kind of always say you don't really ever seek it out. It kind of, you just fall into it. And I do think that's very true. Um, it's very cool work. It's work that you did like literally no day is the same as so, so each day it's kind of different and you're dealing with a lot of different things. Um, and I found that that kind of, that kind of worked for me is much more interesting than kind of the, the same thing uh, day after day after day. So, um, and the reason I came to APAM, so APAM was was cool because I had a, a graduate degree in, in public policy, I was very interested in it. Um, and I also had a ton of experience in association management. So this kind of blended those two things really, really well. Um, and I was lucky enough that, that they hired me. So, and that was, a million years ago, it seems now. So, so it's cool. So it was, I was able to kind of marry those two things, and and I'm pretty fortunate, fortunate for that to have happened. Happened. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from Daisy. Thank you, Genevieve, and thank you, Michelle, again for being here with us today. Um, we're very delightful to have been here today for your talk. Um, you know, I really appreciate some of the, you mentioning some of the ways that you've been um, outreaching to students, especially, you know, with public policy, what the major is, what it can do for you, right? Um, and I really wanted to ask a little bit more, how, could you perhaps tell us about how APAM has transitioned to an online format this past year? Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned some of the ways that, you know, you've been able to do virtual seminars and podcasts, um, but I really wanted to also ask, you know, has APAM experienced any difficulties maintaining relationships with partners and members now being in this virtual setting? Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good question. And it's certainly something that so many groups are, are struggling with. Um, so as I said, so our biggest event, and you know, we, we're a staff of seven people and we work all year towards having our in-person conference. And basically it's folks come together, they stand in a room, they present their research, they discuss it. And there's you know 330 of those, those sessions over four days. So it's a, it's a very in-person kind of dynamic. And changing that into an online dynamic and still having these sort of opportunities, especially for students, because you want students to kind of have the opportunity to meet professionals and meet people that maybe will give them their first job, or at least will kind of be a, a, a contact to, to, to help them kind of move on in their career. To be able to recreate that in a virtual environment is very difficult. And I don't know that we figured it out. I don't know that anybody's figured it out yet, but um we have done we've kind of have moved all our stuff to, to to online and i know there have been some groups and we have had in, internal debates about whether people kind of want to pull back a little bit and maybe maybe not participate and just kind of are, are zoomed out or just don't want to talk anymore or don't want to be on camera anymore and all of those things maybe are true um but our kind of feeling has been if you if there's an opportunity for you to socialize or to talk to someone or even if it's like as awkward as it is over over zoom sometimes um 
having that opportunity and taking and, and bypassing it if you don't want to do it is better than not having the opportunity at all. So kind of we we put a lot of stuff out there and you know sometimes we would have you know like a cocktail hour or whatever or Friday happy hour and like 15 people would be there. So it's it's not a ton of people and that sounds like maybe it's not that engaging but it's it's still you know if you're one of those 15 people maybe maybe it was a, a great opportunity for you. So um so we have had difficulty and I think we're struggling right now because who knows what's going to happen? Who knows if we're going to be able to meet in person? Um, we're doing our online seminars for our students in May. Um, and it's going to be, it's basically over a four week period each Friday. We're doing it for two hours. Um, and I'm curious to see if we get students to, to participate. And Friday is, is tough for students in, in general. I kind of, I feel like are burnt out at that point, but um, with the week studies, but uh whether it, it, it works out or, or not, I'm unsure, but I think we we kind of, the, the sentiment has been, we we need to try because you can't, we don't know how long, A, we don't know how long this is gonna be and B, people people need connection. They just do, whether it's, it's subpar or not, they just, they need it, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. We all know the struggles of being online but it is so important to give students the opportunity, at least a chance to network, especially since time keeps going on and yeah. we have to towards graduation and we're like, oh no, well, we haven't have been able to connect, but it's great to hear that you've been trying and even though it's well, people, there's still a chance to connect with others. No, I, I can't imagine what it would be like for you, especially I think um, most of you are graduating, like being told in March, okay, well, it's, you're gonna go online for a little bit and now it's a year later and you're almost done with, with school, with college in general. It's just, it's mind blowing and it's and it's sad. And obviously we've all missed out on a lot of different things. And I have, I have two little kids and they're in fourth grade. Like they've never seen, before. they've never seen the building for all of fourth grade. But, and, and that's, you know, that's sad too. And it's, it's obviously, it's, it's sad for everybody, but it's just, I, I think if you had a crystal ball and you had told yourself that this is going to last a year plus last March, there would have been a lot of people are revolting, <laughs> but, it's, but yet here we are. I do have a following up question because I know, you know, the the impact that, you know, virtual learning and having sort of everything virtual has kind of given us a different, you know, view on how we will continue moving forward. I kind of just wanted to, you know, pick your brain a little bit on, do you see any of these, you know, virtual events still occurring even after the pandemic? You know, do you see any of these virtual skill sets that we've learned so far being utilized afterwards? Yeah, totally. So it's funny because people that are able to participate in in-person events are, are people that have money that are able to travel or they have the ability to travel. Um, and in some ways you miss out on a lot of people and a lot of different perspectives. So um, for us, it's kind of, it's opened a real, a real big and heavy door for folks that, you know, w definitely want to participate and definitely want to sort of f further their professional development, but don't have the opportunity to do so. And, and kind of with the opportunity uh, right on top of your desk, it's, it's, it's easy enough to do that. So I think um, our kind of objective as a board and, and, and as an organization this year is to, is to really kind of think about it in a hybrid way like obviously we want people want to so our conference is in um austin this year which is a super fun town and people i'm sure want to go and it's november and it's going to be beautiful weather and you know blah 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 i hope we i hope we can meet face to face but there are going to be a lot of people that a are not comfortable traveling and b are just not able to travel whether it's budget or budgetary concerns or otherwise so we want to make sure that those folks are included and i think most organizations want to have a big as big as possible tent to get as many folks to participate and to feel engaged and to feel connected and to network with one another and to be able to to kind of see the field as as welcoming and and, and open and such and it's funny we have um, a new person on our board who's relatively new to the field and uh, we had a zoom last week um, kind of doing some board training and um, 
he said, you know, I always thought APAM was, is, is, is a cool conference to go. It's really fun. And also the people are very welcoming. And that always makes me feel good because you hear folks kind of tell horror stories about other kind of big conferences where you, you kind of are scared to participate because maybe the, the environment is not as welcoming. And that's kind of not what we want to be. We want to make sure that everybody feels welcome and, and is, has a chance to participate. However, that whatever that participa participation might look like. Absolutely, thank you. Um, now I have the next question for you, Ms. Sheehan. Sure. Um, APAM is an affiliated member of the Consortium of Social Science Associations, mm -hmm. which represents the views of the social science research community to the federal government to encourage public support for research. Mm -hmm. um, currently, is there any specific issue APAM has been focused on at the national level? And in addition, um, with the recent transition of administrations from President Trump to President Biden, has this impacted APAM in any way? Um, so the first part, uh, we haven't really, uh, sorry, my dog just wandered in. Um, so we haven't necessarily focused on any issue at a federal level. What we tend to do is, and this is something we kind of debate internally a lot, um, is we kind of speak through COSA and through COPASS is another organization that we're, that we're members of and, and kind of let them do the advocacy for us in, in a more formal way. But one of the things we always kind of push for is funding for social science research. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of our folks that, whether at the university level or government, uh, government researchers that need money to perform research. And when, administrations change. I mean, sometimes that can be good and sometimes that can be bad. Um, you know, obviously the Biden administration is, is, is fledgling at the moment, but I think it's fair to say that uh, the Biden administration is one that kind of more so than Trump values research and evidence and facts and, and what have you. So I think the thought is that 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 emphasis will be reflected in the budget for the NSF and, and agencies and what have you. And, and, and it will then uh, help our members with their research and be able to get grants and such. So, um, so I think there's, there was generally folks uh, when the, when the administration changed, um, if, if, if we can put an emphasis on on facts and, and evidence and 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 the role of research in policy making, we would we would we definitely want an administration that 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 thinks that way too. Definitely, and we of course need funding for our researchers, so it's very important that the federal government puts that importance in facts and research. So, so yeah, it's very good to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, um, now we have another question from Maddie. So I understand, I mean, you mentioned previously during your presentation that APAM has a journal, mm -hmm. uh, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. Um, and the ultimate purpose is to build a professional community of scholars and practitioners devoted to more effective policy analysis and public management. Um, may I ask what issues are typically covered in the journal? I'm wondering too, if maybe this past year, um, the journal has been dedicated mainly to covering issues regarding the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So one of the volumes was a, a COVID volume. Um, but to be honest, there's a lot of different kinds of policy. There's a lot of public management. There's a lot of straight economics. There's a lot of social equity research in there. There's a lot of education research in there. Um, so it kind of runs the gamut of, of uh, social science research. And, and so we typically focus on, we have 15 policy areas that we um, accept proposals for, for our conference. Um, and the journal kind of has just as many. They'll, they kind of uh, will critique the research sort of based on the methods more than kind of what the, um, what the paper is about more than anything. Obviously you want people to, it should be broad enough that people want to read it and there are enough people that are that are interested in it. Um, 
but they, they kind of run the gamut. But yes, they definitely did COVID. And COVID, I think, is one of those cross-cutting things that's going to affect literally everything. Obviously, health policy, but education policy, issues of equity, kind of the vaccine distribution, the, the public management piece of it. It's just, it's, it's touching and affecting virtually every piece of American life. And, and I, I think it's going to, it's going to affect research for decades to come. It's so funny. I remember um, when I first started working at APAM, it was in 2010, and I felt like every other paper and every other session was about the Affordable Care Act. And that has obviously petered out somewhat, but the effect of COVID, I think, is going to go on forever in terms of research. So it's really just, and, and, and it should. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, huge issue. And well, just the, the reverberations and effects are going to be dramatic. Absolutely. COVID has definitely impacted all of us. Yeah, God. Yeah, hopefully it improves soon by the end of the year, hopefully. <laughs> you, and, you and me both, gosh. <laughs> okay, now Daisy has the next question. Um, so I, I know we had mentioned a little bit, um, you know, before about the fall research conference, you know, what it consists of. And I know APAM has you know, hosted um, these conferences as well as a spring conference. I just was wondering if there was a spring conference, you know, um, hoping to happen this year. And for those interested in attending, could you explain the schedule events, how they could participate um, and other sorts of things? So we actually are not gonna have a spring conference this year, um, unfortunately. So the spring conference is usually a much smaller event. It's usually about a hundred people and it generally is for our institutional reps and our institutional reps are our program officers. So basically uh, the, the folks who run your master's and PhD programs. So they would come and they would discuss kind of how they build curriculum and syllabi and all that and uh, kind of get together and discuss those issues and pedagogy and, and what have you. So um, we have put that, we actually put that in hold in 2019. Um, but we usually do some sort of virtual event for the institutional reps to kind of get together and have those discussions. And I, I think that 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 group of people kind of discussing um, how their programs are doing. And I'm sure you see this at your university. There's, I mean, how many people have dropped out of college? How many people are, are just not able to do it right now because of COVID and, 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 and another reason. So it's, it's definitely difficult to be a program administrator right now. And I think um, those folks need to connect and kind of see how other groups are doing. And, and, and obviously, you know, their, their colleges kind of compete and they compete for students and they, the, the competition kind of ebbs and flows and it depends on how the job market is and whether people go to graduate school because they can't find a job, et cetera. Um, and all of those things are, are important and meaningful, but kind of sort of similar to what we touched on earlier, the ability for, the those folks to connect and 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 kind of learn from one another is important so we while we won't have a spring conference this year we'll definitely probably do something virtual for um for those guys to get together and commiserate a little bit about what a crazy year it's been definitely now um kevin has another question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so APAM has both individual and institutional members, mm -hmm. uh, including student members. So how would a student become a member of APAM and what could they expect from being involved? So you can just go to our website and join. It's 40 bucks. Um, it was 40 bucks annually and that gets you discounts on conferences and uh, what you could expect to, to, to find is kind of a lot of virtual event right now, a lot of virtual events. Um, as I said, we have uh, student conferences where if you're doing research and towards uh, either your uh, dissertation or um, in a master's program that you wanna share or kind of hone your, your elevator pitch for your research, if you will, you, you could come to our uh, student conference and, and, uh, and present your paper on a panel. Um, there's also a number of podcasts and webinars and, and, and such uh, that we do 
for students. And we also have a lot of professional development events. So if you're a student who kind of I'm about to graduate, I have an MPP, I don't, I don't know how to kind of negotiate this crazy job market. Maybe I'll go like listen to this webinar from these folks and it'll give me like kind of a good sense of, of how I should sort of be thinking about trying to find a job. So there's a lot of professional development stuff like that. Whether you, whether you uh, maybe uh, have a master's degree and maybe are considering a PhD, that's also another topic that we talk a lot about and have a lot of really knowledgeable and smart folks who kind of can take you by the hands. And we also have mentoring, a pretty robust mentoring program. So we have a hundred, usually about a hundred people um, participating in our mentoring program, it, it usually culminates at our fall conference, but a lot of it has been uh, virtual this year. Uh, and basically students are, are matched up with uh, somebody who uh, works in their field, um, in, their, in their policy area, and, uh, and they kind of just have an informal mentoring relationship. So um, it's just a kind of a nice nurturing environment for a student. And I think if you are interested in really engaging and participating with a lot of other students and professionals, it's definitely a good opportunity. Absolutely. I think it is such a great opportunity for our students and that we that you offer um, these professional building um, opportunities. So if it's possible, maybe we'll link the, the website in the chat um, if right. I'm a student panelist. So it'll be easy to access for our audience members. Sure. Um, so I definitely recommend to check that out just to look over the website. Um, but now I have the final question from our panel. Sure. So um, as we were saying, many of our audience members are students in the undergraduate or the MPP program. And these are students who are entering the research field. So do you have any advice for students interested in pursuing a career in policy analysis and research? Mm -hmm. um, oh, thank you, you posted that. So, it's tough because I think it used to be if you are getting a master's degree or a PhD in public policy or public administration, there's basically two paths. There's, I'm gonna be a professor and I'm gonna kind of go in that field or I'm gonna do something else. And something else is sort of used to be kind of a hodgepodge and a grab bag of, um, I'm gonna go work for the government or maybe I'll go work for a think tank or, or, or what have you. And I think that that has broadened out quite a bit, which is great. And there are still some folks that want to, not some folks, kind of a lot of folks, want to go into teaching and being a professor. And that I think is, 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 is certainly a noble pursuit for sure, but I think it's also hard. And traditionally, I think in PhD programs, um, the 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 fail the sort of the fail safe uh, notion is we're gonna kind of get all these PhDs out and we're gonna get them into academia and they're gonna stay there and that's you know they're not ever gonna move and that we're seeing less and less of that of that and mostly because it's really hard to find a job at, at a university it's it's it not only is it hard to find if you find it in your an adjunct or you're an associate professor it's 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 a tough to find and b you don't make much money and it's it can be in the middle of nowhere and it's 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 tough slog i think and and you know obviously there's 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 plenty of people that want to do that and 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 i applaud them because we we need them but Oh goodness! I think the idea of going and and working for a think tank like a Brookings or a Mathematica or something like that, as a master's or or an early mid PhD, seems a lot more appealing. But as I said, there's there's also there's nonprofit work and there's there's association work and there's for profit work. There are if you have any kind of economics background, there's just how many of these sort of Fortune 500 companies have a very robust. Uh, economics team on their uh, on their staff. So there's lots of opportunities for public policy researchers and analysts to kind of find forge a, a bunch of different paths and and figuring out and that's kind of what, what we try to do when we have events with students is have your traditional professor, but also have a think tank person, have a government person, have somebody from private sector and kind of see 
what a day in the life of those people what it what it looks like and what the salary is like and what a what a typical day is like because I, I mean being an associate professor at a big at a big university is can be a slog and it's not for everybody and it should it shouldn't be kind of this this tunnel vision which I think for a long time in PhD programs it was so keep your options open because there's tons of really cool and interesting things that are happening I think. Yeah, definitely. Public policy is such a wide field. So yeah. our students could really go in anywhere. And it's just getting those connections and going yeah. out into the field and seeing for yourself what you like, I feel like is very important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you Michigan, for answering our student panel's questions. Sure. And now at this time, we're, we are going to open it for questions from our audience. So audience members, um, this is a reminder that you may Pose your questions via the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions for Machine, I will be answering them live. And we currently have a question from Nicole Radin. Um, she's kind of wondering the same thing that we've been talking about. Um, she asks, what opportunities do we have with our undergraduate degree in public policy? Um, let me see. Yeah. Do you have any maybe advice from your personal experience from graduating from undergrad? and then mm -hmm. going, looking into public policy, just a little bit more insight from there. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because when I got my undergraduate degree, public policy was not a major at my college, nor was it something that I really had even heard of at that point. Um, but I would imagine now, um, that's quite a bit different, um, but it, it's, it's funny because I don't have a ton of, of experience with undergraduates because we usually work with with students who are who are um, who are graduate students. Um, but I would imagine that that private sector is looking for that skill set and that skill set is analysis analysis the, the ability to do analysis and research and drill down and be able to crunch numbers and kind of almost like skills almost like a, a, a soft skills like a, like an economist are certainly in demand in the business world and so I would imagine um, kind of focusing on those things and stats class and what have you which I don't actually know if you have to do you have to take that in undergraduate um, yeah like that kind of stuff is 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 important and certainly something that you should leverage in terms of of finding a job and 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 kind of exploring your options but um, this is this is a tough job market. So and we were talking a little bit earlier about kind of what the plans are in gap years and 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 while it's hard to find a job, um, even doing kind of a, 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 a you know, being a barista or working in a restaurant or something, it's certainly building character and and kind of giving you a sense of of. of of kind of the, the soft skills uh, required for for all kinds of jobs, regardless of whether it's a it's a professional kind of career job or or just a job to pay the bills. It's important. Yeah, and here at the UCR School of Public Policy, for our undergraduate degree, we know how difficult it is to find a job, and that's why we require um, an internship for to for our degree. So oh, yeah. Nice. okay, yeah. So our students. Um, are required to intern somewhere and you get um, class credit for it. So at least we could have that experience on paper. And it's a, it's a great opportunity for our students to really get involved and find a research or an internship that they really are interested in. Oh, nice. Do you, um, do, is it, do, do they help you find an internship or do you, okay, that's nice. Yeah, definitely, yeah. We have a great internship coordinator, um, Laura Sosa, and she helps us um, Get, get in touch with um, internships around campus or with anything that might interest us. Oh, nice. That's mm -hmm. very cool. Yep, definitely. Um, as our audience members are typing their questions, I have uh, another question for you, Ms. Sheehan. So um, APAM focuses on a wide range of policy fields, as we were saying, with experts in economic or education and environmental policy. Um, what fields have you seen a now, what fields of policy have you seen arise in research or importance in recent years? So education and environmental policy. So environmental policy when was actually not even really an area when um, 
I mean, it was an area, obviously, so there was research being done, but in APAM, it was not a very big area. And now that, that area of research has really exploded. And even the, the kind of uh, number of degrees that are being given with graduate degrees, whether PhD or master levels, there are so many of them, which is great. Obviously, this is a burgeoning area, and this is an area that we need a lot more research in, um, in order to, to, to kind of implement some of the policies that are important for our society. So that is definitely exploded, um, which is, which is definitely a, a good thing to see. Um, so national security, national security has, has, has also kind of um, exploded as sort of geopolitical stuff is kind of exploding also all over the place. Um, so the study of that and 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 kind of that sort of research is it, it, and it's it's not something that really if you looked at a program from 15 years ago you would see kind of not not really any of any panels on that but um, that that certainly has been important but also public management public management is 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 an area that while it, it's it it can it can be kind of boring and, and, and arduous. It's important how kind of bureaucracy works and how government works and how all of uh, structures are set up. It's it that's something that kind of we need as a society. And 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 uh, well, there's a lot of research sort of being done in that area. And you know we always we always want to make sure that we feature the best the best kind of public management research that that we can get our hands on. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes me happy to hear that environmental policy has been seen arise since um, one of my tracks or um, focuses is environmental policy for my degree. Oh, and nice. So, yeah, so it, I just get happy to hear that there's a more, people are taking environmental policy seriously, especially during these you know, climate change and all these weather events that are going on. We definitely need more focus on the federal state levels, just yeah to make sure that environmental policy is on the agenda. So yeah, it'll, be, it'll yeah. be curious to see where it is as a field in like 10 years, if it's continuing to grow, if there has been a wide embrace by all political stripes and parties and really kind of digging in for to actually kind of try to solve the problems that we have rather than kind of denying that they exist. So I hope, I hope that happens. I personally hope that happens and professionally, I certainly hope yeah, that me happens. Too, me too, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Right, now we have a question from one of our panelists, Maddie. Yes, I'd love to talk a little bit more about this topic. Um, I believe APAM is headquartered in DC. Mm -hmm. um, and I know DC in itself, the whole world of politics, but mm -hmm. I know your, your partnerships are throughout the country mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, UCR is one of them. Have you seen any difference in any differences regarding, you know, policy research in California, say other states versus maybe what's going on nationally, or does there seem to be collaboration or do, do you see, oh, you know, the West coast focuses on this and you know, the Southern states focus on this. It seems, you know, there's this big message of unity. I'm wondering if, with an APAM, if you've seen in DC, through this research, if, if you know different states and parts of the country are working together, or if it's a little bit more secluded, that's a good, it's a good question. So, it's it seems like the most interesting and and kind of relevant research that that we've been seeing is kind of almost at the state level. So there's sort of these state partnerships. Um, so we did an event at Duke recently, a couple of years ago. Um, and it was Duke and a couple other universities in the area. And they were working, it was about opioid dependence, uh, the event that we did. And they had a lot of on our way to see a day's worth of panels. Um, and basically the crux of the, of the event was working sort of the state, working with the research community and the partnerships and kind of creating those coalitions that seems to be happening at the state level a lot more than it's happening at the federal level. So I know, you know, like California has a public policy institute of California, and I know they they work on 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 issues germane to California and 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 kind of that that sort of research that they do, and they're able to kind of form these coalitions and partnerships with. Um, with universities in the area and help state government make decisions. It seems like there's a whole lot more of that 
going on at the state level than there is at the federal level. And one of the things that we, as I said earlier, we kind of want to, to sort of complete this triangle of research informing uh, policymakers and then kind of connecting with, with practitioners for the implementation of the policy. We always want that to happen and we sort of focus on the, on the uh, federal level, which is, is dumb, frankly, because there's a lot of very important and really kind of cutting edge stuff happening at the state level. Um, there's also, we just recently, um, I was reading an article about, um, there's a, a, a lab, there's one in Chicago and one in New York, um, I forgot what they're called, but I, one is uh, affiliated with the University of Chicago. And it's basically, they do a lot of um, criminal justice uh, policy uh, research and they work with the school and then they work directly with the state government to kind of uh, look at sentencing guidelines and all of that. So it's a, you can kind of see the synthesis of, of, of this influence. It, it's in a much, it's in a much smaller triangle than this is I think in the federal, in the federal government. And that's, I, I think kind of what we want to highlight is kind of here's, here's evidence, here's facts, here's research. It's informing this state policy. And then this, the, the policy is, is kind of being implemented at the state level. Um, I wish we could get there at the federal level. And I think there, there certainly is research that's informing federal policymaking, but it's, there's so much other politics and garbage that kind of gets in the way. And obviously that's, that's present at the state level as well, but it seems like just anecdotally as like, as a American citizen, it seems like policy differences have just become so much more, so much bigger and so much broader and so much kind of you're in your camp and this one's in this camp and never the two shall meet. And it's, it's kind of disheartening. It's disheartening professionally, it's disheartening personally. So I, I hope that we kind of begin to move past that at some point. Yeah, for sure. I hope we could just get more partisan relationships and just be able to work together it's just to get things done, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny. I was reading something recently that said like the last Congress, not not the Congress that, that, that from from 2021, but the previous Congress was the least successful Congress in terms of just getting like pieces of legislation through, which I believe. I mean, I feel like we kind of didn't do anything for, for several years and, and, and it certainly felt that way anyway as an observer. So I hope that that that, kind of stops. Definitely, me too. <laughs> so I think we have just about time for just one more question from one of our panelists, Kevin. Um, I know we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I think uh, we can expand on it a little bit. But uh, how do you think the pandemic is going to change how we approach um, policymaking in general on all levels of government? You know, the differences that, um, the changes that we've faced uh, I think might cause a ripple effect, you know, online meeting, mask wearing, all these new things that um, we kind of adapted to um, once the pandemic is over and we quote unquote go back to uh, normal life that um, what kind of ripple effect is that going to have in terms of making policy five or 10 years uh, down the line? Um, I don't know. That's a very good question. I mean, I would imagine that we're going to see kind of the, the, the piece right now that you're sort of hearing about in, in the news, and I think sort of research will bear this out, is the inequity piece. So that's obviously was a, a big part of the last uh, presidential election and kind of the, the socioeconomic status of, of folks who kind of cannot get ahead and how that that inequity gap is is growing and we're seeing that now with covid and we're seeing that with uh with vaccines and what have you and i think that that kind of that growing gap will it will continue to grow and i think as we kind of do some research on the other, hopefully we're on the other side, the other side of COVID, we can kind of see 
the effects of education, uh, the, the disparities in, in students from kind of poor communities and how they were doing with virtual learning and, and kind of vaccine access and sort of this inequity thread through a lot of these themes and ideas. Um, I think will be sort of a, a, a hallmark of a lot of the research that will be done in the next you know five or ten years, and we'll see that those effects play out certainly at the college level too. How many, as I said earlier, like how many folks had to drop out of college because their mom lost their job or something along those lines, and and who who's who's more insulated against that, and and sort of what what that'll mean for society and 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 by extension what it'll mean for policy making so well, we shall see yes we shall see if anything this pandemic will serve as a hopefully as an example of what we need to focus on things like with inequity with in education and healthcare yeah. definitely this pandemic has opened up and has shown a light on things that are definitely lacking yeah if yeah. anything hopefully we could improve in those areas Right. If there's a silver lining at all, maybe that is, maybe that's what it is. Although exactly. it's, um, it's, a, it's a very small silver lining, but still. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have for questions, but I just want to express how grateful we are, Ms. Sheehan, for, um, for having you today. And this thank you for fun. such an engaging conversation. No, this is awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you as well to our audience for joining us. Our next installment of the UCR School of Public Policy Seminar Series will be tomorrow, Thursday, February 25th at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. Dr. Myra Laura will be talking about research, policy, and advocacy, a conversation about education equity in California. So I hope to see you all there. It sounds like a very interesting seminar. But till, until then, on behalf of the UCR School of Public Policy, I wish you all a good rest of your day and a sweet goodbye.